Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, brothers, sisters, dear friends. It's like a head for tuning in to another episode of the Wahda podcast. Uh, we've got a very special guest on today, writer, intellectual, and one of the most talented poets of her generation, Suhaima Manzo Khan, also known as the Brown Hijabi. Suhaima, how are you doing? Assalamu alaikum. Alhamdulillah, I'm very I'm well. Sorry. I'm I'm very b- bowled away by the fact that you did that introduction and you've done it twice now. Yeah, <laughs> I really appreciate yeah. that energy. Yeah, so what's the was getting to? We did we recorded for like ten minutes and yeah. then the, the internet just went and then we had to go again. So Alhamdulillah, but we're we're back. We're we're gonna go at it again, inshallah. But yeah, so hey, my how's lockdown been for you? It's been a bit of a crazy time, right? Yeah, it's been, I mean, Alhamdulillah, I am well, my family are well, and I'm safe. So in that sense, I feel like, you know, I can't really complain. I feel like, you know, I'm self-employed, so I haven't had to worry so much about, like, income. Um, But it has, yeah, it's been very intense, I think. Um, At the start of lockdown, I wasn't in the country. I was actually, I was was supposed to be on a relaxing break in um, Pakistan, visiting my grandma. And then, yeah, the relaxation kind of ended because, obviously, we saw what was happening around the world we weren't sure because the uk wasn't really doing anything so we weren't sure yeah, if it was true. like an urgent or not but then yeah mm. so we, we kind of had to rush home we had to like the border was closed it was really chaotic the government weren't organizing chartered flights they were organizing chartered flights for people in like peru cuba japan nothing pakistan yeah. so then i was trying to like help people get those flights we but alhamdulillah we got home in the end they organized a lot of charter flights in the end but yeah it was it was chaotic so i think since then i've just been very like I should stay in my house because they yeah, safe, yeah. like stay at home. Bit, but yeah, after that sort of experience, you kind of want to just get back to crowd, right? <laughs> yeah. What about you? How's it been for you? Uh, alhamdulillah, it's been well. Alhamdulillah, I'm healthy, so family's all healthy, so that's all you can really ask for. Um, but to be honest, obviously we had Ramadan in in lockdown, right? So it mm. was in in terms of that aspect, it was quite um, it was a new one because you're not allowed, you're not able to go to the mosque and you're not able mm-hmm. to kind of see family and stuff like that, which is kind mm-hmm. of the essence of Ramadan. Um, but still, I think it kind of like put things into perspective for me, kind of showed me what's important in life. And yeah, that kind of made me have a better connection with Allah, alhamdulillah. But yeah. Mashallah, so, yeah. No, I think a lot yeah. of people said that, that it was like a time to kind of, you know, really, what does taqwa mean when no one is looking? Yeah, like, what, what does it exactly. mean to truly introspect? So that's good to hear. Yeah. Yeah, but um, yeah, as as we're in lockdown, kind of coming out the end of it now. Um, sure. As a poet, how has it been? I presume that having a bit of creative solitude may help you as a poet, kind of get more right, get more writing time and stuff like that. Yeah, no, no, you would think that, and I did, I did also think that. Um, but I think, I think with lockdown, because it's actually quite intense. Like I've, I've, a lot of people I was going to have sort of said, you, you know, like you end up introspecting a lot, like spending. A, a, spending time on your own in a different way or kind of just yeah. just kind of reflecting on you know looking inwards I think we look outwards all the time as human beings like we're always looking at what's going on you know whether it's social media yeah. or the world politics whatever but having to look inwards is different and I think I thought that would lend itself to writing to creating you know I had commissions but I also had things that I wanted to write of my own and I every time I tried I just hit like a block like just really feeling yeah. like I, nothing's coming out nothing's flowing and so I think I think times like this, we can often actually put pressure on ourselves to be creative, to like, you know, use the time to its fullest um, advantage and all that kind of thing. Um, And I think, yeah, you know, we should have practices to be creative, to write. But I also think sometimes you can put a lot of pressure on yourself. And for me personally, that's why I I realized I was just doing that. So I kind of then took a step back and just, I wrote something recently. I did finish a commission, but it was, what I ended up writing was very kind of, it was about how difficult I found it to write, to be honest. It was quite meta in that way, but I think yeah. that's sometimes how it is. Yeah, obviously, with some of the stuff you write about, which is fantastic, um, some of the topics you, you discuss very eloquently, issues like Islamophobia and racism, and um, even during this this time, during the pandemic and the lockdown and everything, we're still kind of seeing the way the media kind of portrays ethnic minorities in this country. We mm. kind of saw a few, few months ago, the Daily Mail article, um, Claiming that all the fifty uh, percent of all the COVID cases that came into this country were from Pakistan, which is not true, as you said earlier. That yeah, could even get home. Even make sense. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah, and I think I think, but, but you know, you point out a, an important point, which is that I think we sometimes think. I remember saying to my friends that, like, in a global com- pandemic, you expect other issues to sort of dissolve a little bit or kind of move yeah. to, the, to the back but in, if anything i think this has enhanced those structural problems you know racism yeah. has come further to the surface and we see 
you know, whether that's in the structural sense that like the outcomes, who is getting this disease, who is most exposed to this virus and, and who is dying the most, or whether it's in like the way that the different groups of scapegoated. And I was exactly. saying to you earlier that, you know, um, just before Eid, there was this, obviously this local lockdown that was announced at like 9 yeah. p.m., you know, no yeah. formal announcement it was tweeted by, I think, the exactly. health secretary. And yeah, yeah and, and the implication, the, the kind of insinuation is those areas are places where Muslims are going to be going out tomorrow for Eid. So Muslims spread this virus. Muslims don't listen. Muslims need regulation. And it just plays into that classic narrative. It's, it's so disingenuous yeah. and frustrating. But I think it's just a way to deflect, as always, from what the, the fact that the responsibility lies with the government and they've been making mm. terrible decisions. There's not terrible decisions. Some wave is not down to people. Do you know what I mean? It's down to the ways it's yeah. been managed. I think it's always that historical thing that you look back in history as well. There's always trying to find a scapegoat to kind of lay the pressure off of the, those who are in power, essentially. Because if you look at the way uh, the government has dealt with this crisis, it's been terrible. Yeah, in terms absolutely. Of the death toll, you know, the, just everything has just been terrible. Absolutely. And trying to hide it as well. And like, you know, the fact that I saw, you know, a lot of people have been talking about how we should be grieving, really. Like, this is, you know, yeah. the numbers of people who died, but there's no. There's no vigils. There's no, you know, all of the stuff that occurs when you see a moment of like kind of spectacular, a spectacle exactly. of violence. But this mm. is just like we're supposed to be normalized to it now and not care. Yeah, mm. it's just, it's just, you look at the death toll every every night and it's just become a number. There's not, yeah. we don't we kind of forget that there's people who, there was a person who died. It's not just part, it's not just a number on a sheet, you know? Yeah, it's so dehumanizing. And I think the, yeah. the fallout of that is going to be really for our mental health for a whole generation, I think. Oh, yeah. Like, damaging. Definitely. The COVID generation. Yeah, subhanAllah, yeah. SubhanAllah. But uh, yeah, um uh, we're kind of moving on from that. Kind of onto a bit of a lighter note. Um talk <laughs> about um obviously I kinda of wanna get an idea about your journey um mm -hmm. into poetry essentially. What what inspired you to be a poet? Like <laughs> in the, in an Asian household, it's not the most kind of we're kinda of looking at the, the stereotypes that we're trying to debunk, but um in a, in a typical Asian household, yeah, yeah. Um, being a poet is not necessarily the most, um, you're not going to be lauded by your parents, are you? No, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I feel like historically in South Asian, Persian, yeah. African, uh, yeah. Muslim societies, poets, um, shiries were like these amazing, you know, lauded yeah, yeah. people. And I think, exactly. you're right, you pointed out a very interesting thing, which I think is that creativity isn't really so much seen as an, a, an important or valuable part of our lives in the generation that we're in but i think a big yeah. part of that is also the kind of impact of colonialism on our households on our psyches on our families and i think as, as immigrants to this country a lot of times our families have had to have had to kind of internalize the idea that our value is our economic mm. output and our economic yeah. output is assured by jobs that give us much security like you know that's whether true. that's law or banking or finance or you know being a doctor or something where yeah. you will have a stable career so i understand yeah. where that comes from but I, I, yeah i'm with you and i, I think it, i find it crazy that i you know and i was taking me a long time to say yes i am a poet that is what i am <laughs> um because it doesn't it's not something i ever expected myself to be saying and i think even at school you know i, I had didn't really have a lot, big interest in poetry poetry wasn't something yeah. i found particularly interesting it was you know like Shakespeare's sonnets and these things yeah. that I, didn't, I wasn't really vibing with them if I'm honest no, 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 no. <laughs> so I think for me the journey is really less like I oh I you know this is something that I'm aiming for and more something that you know I really believe kind of Allah put in my path and I just sort of yeah. was stumbled into it but I think there were definitely decisions that I took on the way and so uh, to kind of give you a quick synopsis of that journey I think you know, I was um, I was studying history. Um, that was my undergraduate degree. Uh, I always enjoyed English, but I was studying history. Um, but during that time, I actually was I was very depressed. Um, I was really struggling. I was studying at Cambridge University, which we can talk about in a, in a minute anyway. But yeah. that was it was you know coming from a state school background, coming from the north of England, being a visibly Muslim woman. Uh, yeah. It was it was very exclusive, and I think that really affected my my mental health, I didn't feel very seen. I didn't feel very um, understood. And I was advised by somebody, like a college nurse kind of person. She just said to me, what's something that you've always wanted to do, but you never thought that you could do? Uh, and I was like, well, I was like, well, actually, I, I really enjoy watching like this slam poetry type stuff online, and it's oh, you know, yeah. so that's more like hip hop kind of rap styling, and and it comes from like a history of African American and protest yeah. poetry. Um, and I was like, well, obviously, that's not anything I could, you know, I can't do that. That's not me. 
So she said to me, no, you're going to go. You're going to go to an open mic night. She found me an open mic night. So that's where people go to share poems. And she said, you're going to go and you're going to perform something. And I didn't even have anything that I'd written to perform. So I was like, what? Oh, wow. Yeah, like, how can I do this? But I was also really excited. And she did tap into something, which is that, you know, I think sometimes we just need permission. We were just waiting for somebody to give us permission to do the thing that we really want to do. And for me, that was a way of expressing myself. So once I did it once, I was really enchanted by it I guess it was like yeah. this is so, such a validating and powerful tool of speaking in this institution where I felt so silenced to be able yeah. to, to for someone to say three minutes you on the stage everyone's listening to you it was like wow I can tell them how it feels what I'm experiencing and so from the start as well I think my poetry was always political in that sense that what was personal was political from the very get-go yeah. and when I to speak about it was political in that space and so yeah then I got involved in like university slams so that's like competitions um you know national slams and competitions and so my poetry kind of got more exposure and alhamdulillah I was just very lucky to have one poem that really went viral and that on the back of that people thought I was you know, a poet they thought I yeah. had more poems and you know, I think I just kind of leaned into that and I thought, okay, well, let's see where this goes. Um, because I, I, you know, I actually had a job lined up for after university. I was ready to, to go. And then I just thought, what if I take the risk? What if I, you know, follow these invitations that are coming up? This momentum might end soon. But I was getting invited to the USA. I was getting invited to Australia, to Berlin. And I was like, you know, why don't I just see what happens? And alhamdulillah, yeah. that's, that's sort of just the momentum has kept going. So yeah, yeah, it wasn't something necessarily planned, but I think I leaned into the plan of Allah. Yeah, alhamdulillah. And I kind of wanted to ask you about, obviously, kind of your rise as a poet. With other, with other things like with YouTube and things like that, and other sources of media and that, when, as you get more mainstream, you kind of have shackles, you could argue, that are put on you. Kind of certain people want you to do certain things. Mm. Is it the same with poetry where you're kind of given opportunities by certain people and they're saying, oh, we need you to talk about this issue. We need you to talk about this issue. Is it more liberating in poetry where you, you do have that control to speak about what you want? Yeah, I think the interesting thing about poetry is that people, it's framed as something that is not political. It's, it's artistic, right? So I yeah. think with that, there does come a bit of freedom because people don't necessarily expect you to talk about things that are important or, or valuable. And I think that's a real misunderstanding of poetry. But I think what it means is that Actually, yeah, you have a bit more freedom, I feel. I feel like if I'm invited to something as an activist, I don't have as much freedom to speak. Whereas if yeah. I'm invited as a poet, I do. And like, I remember a couple of years ago, um, the BBC got in touch with me to do like, um, they have these like little explainer videos and it was just called like, in my opinion, blah, blah, blah. Right. And you could say whatever in your opinion. Now they approached me as a poet, which kind of gave me the scope to think, ah, oh, they're not thinking I'm going to do something quite radical or political. So I will. Whereas if they'd approached me as a, campaign or, po or or activist or whatever words people sometimes use then I feel like I would have been a bit more constrained so I think yeah I think it is a bit more liberating but of, of course you're right you know we, the more we are exposed the more people see our work um, and the more that we also fall into the trap of desiring to be seen yeah. uh, desiring to be palatable desiring to be mainstream I think we get entangled in that web then of kind of yeah what's palatable what's allowable, what's acceptable. Because mm, one thing I've kind of seen as I'm a fan of poetry, so I've seen kind of some of the people I look at um, is there's almost this desire to, to not to be seen and palatable, like you said, but not to be too mainstream because you kind of lose your way in a, in a sense, you know, with a more like underground, uh, like the slams you talked about, it's a lot more unfiltered. You can be yourself a lot more. Um, and yeah. you kind of become, you can argue you become less genuine as you, get to the top if that makes sense no i think that's a real threat yeah i think that you know uh what allows us to be real and speak our truth is is the safety to be honest and usually yeah. you know that those underground kind of those spaces that are on the ground where a community is there and so you feel that like you are able to speak in certain ways now if you add a camera and you add you know yeah, yeah. a couple of more official people then i think yeah you do you feel constrained and I, and I also know a lot of people who feel that like because of the the whiteness of mainstream institutions and the fact that mainstream spaces will see them already in a certain way, that is also limiting. So in those spaces that are yeah. on the ground, you know, it's, it's also easy to just, you don't feel that, that kind of pressure to represent a certain group of people or to kind of have to speak on the behalf of, you can just sort of share your story. So yeah, I think it's, a, it's definitely, there's pros and cons and it's quite a complicated space. Yeah. And I kind of wanted to get, um... You talked about Cambridge, you went to Cambridge um, earlier. I kind of want to get um, a bit about that. 
as as obviously you said, you're a visibly Muslim woman from the north, you know, um, British Pakistani and all that. Cambridge University and alongside probably could say Oxford University as well is kind of always perceived to be a bit elitist if that makes sense, a bit snobby, yeah. etc. Um, how was it kind of fitting in um, in a university environment like that? Yeah, I mean, I would definitely say I, I never fit in. That was for sure. I think it's um, I think it's it's complicated. There's a lot that can be said about it. Um, I you know I found a lot of solace in the fact that there were there was other women of color specifically who yeah. were really trying to think about what it meant to be in that space and we had a group called fly and we actually have written a book since we left university just about those experiences and i the reason i mentioned that is not sort of to be like buy that book but to say that it's a com it's actually a very big like i feel like the answer ever answer that question feels so big like there's so much to say because it was i would never want to put somebody off from kind of applying to um Oxford, right and yeah. i think particularly like people of color i think that that you know we i don't want to say that like you shouldn't and you don't deserve to that's not the point the point is that when you are there it would be disingenuous of me to say that it's easy or that like it's um yeah. accepting and i think the the truth is that all universities are have structural problems and we're yeah. living in a moment where universities become more and more like a a business basically it's a money-making business so yeah. because of that the student kind of well-being is not at the forefront now if you're a student of color in particular if you're a muslim student in particular the university has also become a place of surveillance through the prevent strategies become a place True. where yeah. what you say is being watched is is it suspect is what you're saying something dangerous yeah. you're already going to stand yeah. out you might feel like you're not you know you're not you're not really seen in the same way there's certain expectations or assumptions about you so yeah yeah I say all of that just to say that, like, I think as long as we go into those spaces, knowing that we're not there simply to, to concede to their values, to fit to their values, to, to assimilate, but we're there to potentially take the resources, take that social capital. Yeah. You know, what I like to think that I've done is take the social capital, you know, take that certification that says that you've got that degree, yeah. but then share with share back to the community take those resources back to those people that you that you came from that you went to school with right and i think it's very easy sometimes when we get i think we're encouraged by like the state the government the structures the institutions yeah. to come into those spaces and then gatekeep become gatekeepers ourselves close the door behind us True. right and keep rising yeah. so you get your sajid javids your pretty patels your sarah True. Khans, you get these people and i think what's much more important is that if we do access those places to then share the resources, to then say, I refuse to become what you want me to become. Because that's otherwise true. I think that's my hesitation where it's then like encouraging other people to just become another oppressor. Like yeah, that's not what I want exactly. us to be. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, it's a complex one. It's kind of the, um, the idea of to integrate rather than to assimilate. I think people want you to, they say they want you to integrate, but rather they want you to assimilate. And then like you said, you have the Sajid Javis and the Pretty Patels where they kind of, they've kind of record themselves to, to kind of put, like, isolate themselves away from their their, their ethnicity, their, their creed, essentially. Yeah, um, and they're directly, you know, invested in racist policies as well, themselves. Yeah. yeah, if you look at, like, the foreign policy that Priti Patel came up with a few months ago, like, by that metric, her own parents wouldn't have been able to come to this country, so it's a bit... That's the thing, and it's, yeah, I think when you've reached that level of cognitive dissonance is because you really have cut you've really internalized this idea that you are assimilated but you've misunderstood yeah. how white supremacy works you're, you're never going to be able to enter in so instead i think that shouldn't be our goal our goal should be to always disrupt and to point out where we see hierarchies of power and we see oppression you know as muslims i really think that's our duty to point it out and yeah. so to say you know i've sometimes used the analogy of a cambridge degree being like a police badge in the sense True. that it's something that you get after having gone through a really racist kind of in yeah. inculcation into this culture this cult right so you come out with a police badge now this badge allows you to enter lots of spaces because people give it all this authority they're like that's yeah. something really important so what you really need to be doing with the power of this police badge is to actually to to kind of rescind it to say look this is awful this was made of violence i i don't want any part in this and the more you can reveal the parts of kind of power power structures that you've been part of I think that's maybe the most important thing you can do after having gone through something like that. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, and now after that, kind of, I hope, I hope the brothers and sisters still are interested in going to unit after that. But uh, no, you, you should I, definitely. Yeah. yeah. 
It's just yeah, about what I'll we do. But why are we there, right? Yeah, I think as Muslims, exactly, we always have it. to ask ourselves those why questions. Do we do just that's do things true. just to be on the, you know, just because it's like the the roadmap somebody else has given us, or is it because yeah. we have a plan and it's all trying to get us closer to Allah? You know, if everything in our lives yeah. is trying to get us closer to Allah, then we have we have to constantly be asking ourselves, what well, am I really doing this for yeah. status, for praise? And I have to ask myself this all the time. Like I, I definitely am not um, a good example, but I think it's something we all have to be asking ourselves. Yeah. And I kind of wanted to um, ask you about, obviously, the majority of the brothers and sisters who are listening, watching this, um, they're probably in that age where they're thinking of going to uni or they're already at uni. I kind of wanted to ask you about any advice you could give to them about university life, how to maybe remain focused, remain on mm-hmm. uni, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think something that's really important, I suppose, in hindsight, that I would just, that I would maybe say to myself, age 17, 18, 19, is that, you know, Be true to who you are, right? I think it's so easy to be wrapped away and kind of taken away and and, um, by the kind of norms that are imposed on us. So whether they are norms of like, feeling just that you have to kind of go to events that you're not interested in, right? It can be as simple as and low level as that. Like I really, I don't care about this thing, but because my friends are going, I'm gonna go. And I think sometimes we betray ourselves in the sense of just like, we. We feel like we have to be somebody that we're not, but that can also be as big and more kind of, I think more harmful to us as kind of, I suppose, making up self, ourselves into distinct parts, right? And so I give the example of myself. I think in my first year of university, I definitely treated Islam as like, it's the secret part of me, right? So I would never tell anybody I'm going Uh, to pray. I would just say, I'm, oh, I'll just be back in five minutes. Like, I'm just gonna go. Um, And I think obviously it would have been easier if there were other Muslims around me. But the fact there weren't many, so I would, it was this separate thing, right? I was like, yeah, I'm Muslim, but I don't like make that obvious. I'm kind of, or even though I wear a hijab, right? But I think I try to keep yeah. it as otherwise as kind of, basically as secular as possible. And I think often we actually, we all encourage to secularize our religiosity. And what yeah, that means true. is that we keep it private, right? We privatize our faith. And so it's like, that shouldn't be something that influences your opinion. It should be something that, you know, influences who you are. Whereas Islam really demands us that Islam yeah. is everything that we do. And that doesn't mean that we need it to is. be like doing dawah on campus all the time. But all it means yeah. is that you are Muslim in all that you're doing and you're not afraid to be Muslim. And I think I wish that that was something someone had said to me that just be true to who you are, right? You, you're you yeah. never going to be... I think what we have to remember is that like sometimes I think we're craving we're craving being seen by others. We want people to really understand us, really see, you know, see the, the you who you really are. But I think at some point in your life, you, you have to realize that, you know, Allah is the only one who will see us for who we truly are. And That's so true. if we spend all our time trying to get others to kind of understand us when they might not, I think you just, you're putting a lot of energy into maybe a project that is quite exhausting. And so I hope that makes sense. But my, my real kind of, my real concern for people is just, yeah, having the confidence to be who you really are and be true to your principles. But to be honest, I think I, I'm I'm more inspired by the by your generation now. I mean, there's not that many years between us, but I see like yeah. you know people going to university now, and I feel really like people are much more confident in in who they are as Muslims in Islam as as their kind of not just their identity but their faith. And I think that that is something I'm you know proud to see in in younger people now. Why? How do you think? Why do you think that is? Well, I'm interested to know why you think it is because you're the ones who I see it in. I think <laughs> I, I think the impression I get is that, you know, we've all I think generationally, we've sort of seen our grandparents came to this country generally, or maybe our parents, and I think they tried really hard to fit in, right? They tried to yeah. tick all the boxes to do everything right. And their children, our parents, let's say, saw that that didn't work. Their parents were still treated as other, as outsiders. So then that generation, I think they had a bit more of an approach of, you know, here today, here to stay. That's a chant that they used to have in the 80s, here today, here to stay. But still, I think they were attempting to kind of claim the ground here, to say we are British. But I think our generation, I feel like we've got to a stage now where it's like, we see that none of these methods have worked, right? but still we are perceived to be outsiders, still we are perceived to be other, still we can be stripped of our citizenship at any moment, we can be deported at any moment, we can be detained, we can be stopped and searched, we can be interrogated under Schedule 7. And I think all of that, I believe, actually counterintuitively, has led us to kind of have a confidence that it doesn't, we're going to embrace who we are because look, 
by not embracing it, nothing's changed for us. So that's how I see it. But I don't know. What do you think? Do you see that in your generation? Do you see people um, being more unafraid? Yeah, I think so. I think there's a sense of being more unapologetically who you are. Um, because it's almost as if the, sy- the system is against you. So you might as well just be you. Because yeah. if you're not you, you're going to be be ostracized or you're going to be kind of demonized for it. Um, and if you embrace who you are, you probably get the same as well. But at least you're being yourself. Mm, if that makes yeah. sense. And you're embracing no, who you sense. really are. Yeah. Um, but yeah, talked about, um, you talked about the, um, the revoking of citizenship and stuff. And we saw that with the Shamima Begum thing. Um, I don't know about you, but for me, when that happened, that kind of showed me that we're really, we really aren't safe. Like, that just because you, you're dual national or whatever, that shows that you really are an other in this country. 100% I mean even if you're not a dual national I think that's the really important part is that we I think what that Shamim Bain case should have shown to us is that our citizenship is precarious because Britishness yeah. Britain cannot imagine itself beyond whiteness so for me what that moment really reinforced was oh so when people say oh British means you know a cup of tea a cue all of these like cutesy things Actually, yeah. that's a lie because mm-hmm. the only thing when it comes down to it that Britain can kind of define itself by is whiteness. Because if Shamima hadn't been white, uh, sorry, had been white, they wouldn't have assumed she had somewhere else she could apply for citizenship. To. And so true. in this country, you can only have your citizenship stripped if the Home Secretary believes and they just have to kind of feel that you could be provided with citizenship elsewhere. Obviously, Bangladesh yeah. refused her citizenship too, so it didn't exactly. work. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, I think... You know, we, we also have to remember that Shamim Begum's case was in a year where there was over 100 other people who were stripped of their citizenship. A majority yeah. of them were Pakistani, as far as I understand. And it was like, oh, wow. it was often under counter-terror laws that people are stripped of citizenship. So then you begin to see there's a kind of confluence then. There's, a, there's, a, there's something there that means that being a person of colour in this country and being not a citizen are basically one and the same. And we saw it with the Windrush generation being deported. That, again, yeah. is another example where you can live here all your life, but you can also be disposed of when the state chooses yeah. to. And once you've given all your years and everything you've been of use, now you can go back to where you came from and that, a country that you don't actually even know, really. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I kind of, now, kind of coming um, into near the end of the podcast, um, I wanted to get, you've released, in September of 2019, you released your anthology, Post-Colonial Banter. How did, yes. how did that come about? <laughs> um, so how did it come about? Good question. Well, so in the January of that year, so a little bit earlier, um, I had uh, published a book with a couple of my friends. So from Fly, the group yeah. I was talking about earlier, yeah. we published a book um, called The Fly Girl's Guide to University. And yeah. the publisher because I had a couple of poems in that book, um, ones that I now find really cringy actually, but anyway, I had them in that book, but they, they suggest, they just offered like, would you like to, they're a poetry press, so they print poetry usually. Yeah. Yeah, And they just said, would you like to kind of publish a collection with us? And I was like, well, you know, that's amazing because actually it's quite, it's quite difficult to publish poetry otherwise. Um, And then I, I think it was just, it was just a kind of like thinking about what I wanted to include in there, like, what I wanted the story to be, like, did I want to include more personal poems or not? And I think because a lot of my work is obviously spoken word, I was quite nervous that, like, you know, it's not going to be the same when people are reading my work. You know, for you to just take my book and read it on the bus, I don't have any control over, like, how you're reading it, like, how you're hearing it, how you're engaging with it. So that was quite nerve-wracking, actually. Um, But, yeah, alhamdulillah, it was a good process. And, like, it's almost been a year now that it's been out, which is wild. Yeah, yeah, alhamdulillah. Yeah, but what would you say is like when you when some what, what do you want someone to get out of it you know when someone picks up your anthology what, what do you want someone to is there like a distinct message would you say or from yeah i think yeah so i think it depends who you are what i want you to get out of it and i think if you i kind of distinguish in my head between like people who will understand these poems because they share this experience yeah um and there's lots of people that that will look like but I want those people to really feel validated by this book. I want it to feel like you are seen, you are not alone. Um, yeah. I feel these things too. And um, look, I'm, I'm, I'm saying them and that means somebody's hearing them. And so, and I feel that often sometimes when, you know, when I have audiences that are mainly people of color or mainly Muslim, it feels like, you know, we're just sharing this really beautiful moment of kind of saying we see each other. And by seeing each other, yeah. we say, I acknowledge your reality. It's not, you're not making it up. You're not crazy. This is racist. This is happening. And on the other hand, 
there's an audience who won't have shared these experiences with me and for them i want them to feel uncomfortable to be honest i want them to feel disrupted oh, wow. yeah i want them yeah. to feel a little unclear about this isn't easy to digest this isn't just you i don't want them to be able to say like oh these are poems about being a muslim because it's much yeah. it's much more multifaceted and complicated yeah, yeah. than that and i think for any reader i want them to leave with a kind of sense that that our world is complex our worlds our individual worlds are complicated and you know even the title post-colonial banter yeah, is yeah. deliberately an oxymoron like i want to recognize is, that yeah. my life is obviously like there's all these traumas there's all these structural violences but there is also a joy in it and there is also you know yeah. i i find moments of like laughter through that violence and i find ways of bonding yeah. with people through those kind of tragedies and so yeah i think the overall message would just be like you know we are we are not one thing or another we are and we should have the i think for us to be truly human means to have the be able to be allowed to have the range of things to be able to be yeah many many things yeah you can't put us into a box per se exactly 100 percent. and we don't want yeah. boxes you know we, we don't, don't want, want boxes <laughs> yeah. Break, breaking binaries exactly exactly breaking binaries um but yeah i think that's i kind of got that same idea from if you've read um the good immigrant by Nikesh yes. Shukla. Yeah, I got the same thing from there. It's like if I was so if we were to read that book, you're you're turning a page, you're nodding your head at everything. If you yeah. give that maybe to a white British person, the heads kind of going a bit. They're like, what's going on? Like, yeah. like exactly. what, what are you on about? Yeah. yeah, and I think that's really powerful and and important. And I think you're right. There's a lot of new literature. I think that's doing that. You know, people. It's not new literature, but it's just that it's getting published at last. Yeah, it's getting it's getting um the attention it deserves. Exactly. Um, kind of coming to the end now, so hey, Ma, I kind of wanted to ask if, if possible, if you could perform or like read a, one of your works. Yeah, I, I don't know actually know what to perform. Um, how many minutes do I have, or how much time? Should, should... Uh, how however long you, you think's necessary. It's I can fine. do it. I can do a three minute poem. Is that do we have time for three that's minutes? Cool. That, that's cool. <laughs> okay, okay. <clears throat> so this is one of my favorite poems to perform, which is why I'm going to do it. And uh, I think also just because we spoke about a lot of topics that kind of yeah. feel like linked to this. Um, yeah. So this poem is called um, British Values. And in this book, I also have kind of after a lot of the poems, like I have what I've called a context box where I've kind of explained okay. why this is relevant. So it's called British Values. And I wrote it because British Values is actually part of the counter-terrorism strategy. And I don't know yeah. if a lot of people know that. Yeah. yeah. So extremism is defined as opposition to British values, which I just thought was really interesting. Yeah, and the more I dug smart. into it, yeah, the more I had more to say. So it goes like this. This minute there. Young Muslims in Britain often straddle two worlds. They appear to have a foot in each cultural concerns revealed around the national identification of Muslims in Britain. Review raises alarm over social integration in the schools to promote fundamental British fact. The face of Britain is changing beyond recognition. I look in the mirror. It's not shattered. I am whole. No one foot in, one foot out. No reason I've got to learn Britishness from the somehow more devout. I'm not uneasy, torn or straddling. It's not shattered. I am whole. Yet the opposite is somehow all that you'll get told. I mean, I guess because if it wasn't, if we faced up to the glass, you'd be left with the fact that I am inside. I am Britain now. Because Britain is Bismillah. Britain is basmati rice. Britain is box braids and black barbers shops, Bollywood and Bungara. Britain is Bradford and Barking and Birmingham. Britain is biryani and black beans. Britain is black. Britain is brown. Britain is boys blasting dubstep on the bus to town. Britain is body popping outside the tube. Britain is brick lane before it was cool. Britain is bilingual. Britain is the broker. Britain is praying in the changing rooms. Britain has its feet in your sink. Britain is bad at knowing itself, belligerent and boring. Britain has not changed beyond recognition. Recognize it was never one thing. I am the inside you pretend is outside, but we have to stop pretending. Pretending the rolling hills are just romantic, not remnants of injustices swept under a rug, like the tea didn't come from Asia, like its sugar wasn't grown by slaves, like dry humor isn't a way to just ridicule dissent and cues don't expose the way we're always told to wait for change rather than making it. And it's funny that over-apologizing is seen as a national trait, because half of history is still waiting. I look in the mirror, it's not shattered, I am whole, there is no brink or turning point. I'm here. Britain is barbaric. Oh, sorry, did you think that was me? Barbaric bystander straddling the boundary, not quite inside, so you could say I'm the things you forgot, like you're modern, so I'm backwards, you're democratic, so you say I'm not. 
When the truth is, Britain is blood on its hands and back to the wall. Britain is selling weapons to the most repressive regimes in the world. Britain is the bombs the Saudis drop on Yemen. Britain is using fear to build surveillance apparatus since 9-11. Britain is believing in human rights whilst removing them all. Britain is Yarls, Wood, Brook, House, Colm, Brook and Morton Hall. Britain is 1,600 dead in or after police custody since 1990. And Britain has no qualms about detaining asylum seekers indefinitely. Britain is suicide attempts, secret courts and secret torture. Britain is stopping you at the border. Britain is seeing it, saying it, sorting it, which means Britain is also deporting it, because what else do you do when you look in the mirror and find? The sugar and tea had strings attached. The factories on the rolling hills depended on our labour. The bombs destroyed the homes of kids now at the border. Britain is barbaric. Britain is blindly patriotic. Britain is built on false narratives, slices of other people's dishes. Britain is stolen artifacts in museums named after itself. Britain is knife and fork polite, stabbing you at will. Britain is selective. Yours till it's not. In yours till it's not. Them blaming you. Britain is borders. Britain is Brexit. Britain is spending on weddings but not fireproofing homes. Britain is cutting mental health services yet somehow strong and stable. Britain is 50% of young people in custody being from ethnic minority backgrounds and Britain is blaming them for this statistic rather than asking difficult questions because Britain is blaming the kids who aren't white. Britain is blaming the Muslims. Britain is blaming the immigrants. Britain is blaming bureaucracy. Britain is not listening. Britain is not that great. Britain is breaking. But breaking everywhere except the place it points the finger. Because there's only a few things left that are great about Britain. And there that Britain is bismillah, basmati and bilingual. Box braids and black barbers shops, Bollywood and Bungara. Body popping outside the tube, brick lane before it was cool. Britain is the broker. Britain is praying in the changing rooms. Britain has its feet in your sink. Britain is your greatest nightmare. Every repercussion you never thought through. Britain is the terror to be counted. Britain is the mind to be got inside. I am the great in Great Britain now, and aren't you terrified? Mashallah, <laughs> that was amazing. Just like a hip hop performer. That was fun. Um, thank you. That's a, that's a great way to end the podcast, brothers and sisters. <laughs> um, again, thank you, Sahima, for coming on. It's been a pleasure to have you on today. Not at all. Um, Not at all. We, need, we need to get you on again because it was, a great, it was great chatting to you. I would love to. Um, no, thank where, you. Where can our brothers and sisters find you? Give us a, your socials. Yeah, um, so on Twitter, my handle is at the brown hijabi. Um, I do chat, chat a lot there. So if you're less interested yeah. in chat, then at the brown hijabi on Instagram, um, where I post more um, more stuff. And yeah, and you can see a lot of my work is on YouTube. Um, if you want to buy my book, I request that you please don't buy it through Amazon because I'm not really interested in supporting an exploitative corporation. So please buy it through Verb Poetry Press website. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for having me on and like keep yeah. up the amazing work. This is really, really, exactly. I'm really impressed. I, I wish I was doing what you guys have been doing when I was 17. So mashallah, keep up. Exactly. Hey, we have people like you are inspiration. So exactly. Hey, again. Paving, right, paving yeah. the way for us. Allah mabarak. But anyway, that was the Wahda podcast, brothers and sisters. Jazakallah hey, You can check us out on Instagram at team underscore Wahda and our YouTube channel, team Wahda. This podcast will, inshallah, be available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and Google Podcasts. It's been amazing. Sahima, thank you. Jazakallah. Till next time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.